uh, today, uh, last, last Stevens lecture, uh, late Stevens. Stevens, um, Stevens after, after World War II, uh, in the late 40s and early 1950s at the end of his life. That, that's my subject. <coughs> really, uh, the, the latest writing that we will have um, chronologically, historically, that we will have discussed so far. Uh, one of the, the general themes of, of what I had to say uh, has been modern poetry's um, uh, uh, role in, in, a, in a secularizing culture, uh, how the general decay of personal religious belief and practice enters into uh, the way in which these poets imagine what poetry is, uh, what it means for them, uh, what uh, they can do with it. Uh, it is a habit with me to be thinking of some substitute for religion, uh, Stephen says in a letter. My trouble and the trouble of a great many people is the loss of belief in the sort of God in whom we were all brought up to believe. Stevens, however, uh, responds to this problem vigorously. <coughs> uh, he tends to see it, as I've been saying, as an opportunity. Power and freedom that were formally assigned to God are claimed for man, uh, for the human, uh, for the poet in particular. Uh, but the poet uh, viewed in Stevens not as a kind of exemplary individual, but as a kind of uh, model of the human uh, and of, uh, in fact, uh, common uh, properties and powers uh, within us. Uh, in general, I would say that the poet stands for the a kind of general human capacity to create the world in the act of seeing and describing it. Uh, very much as Marie was arguing uh, last Wednesday. Uh, Stevens, as I began by saying, is very much a poet of this world. Uh, we are an unhappy people in a happy world. Uh, the world, however, is, uh, as uh, the Aurors of Autumn suggests, without malice towards us. Uh, original sin, what Stevens calls uh, the enigma of the guilty dream. Uh, this is a kind of exhausted fiction that Stevens throws off. Uh, he lives uh, in a world that's full of sensual, seasonal pleasures and perceptions, including the primary pleasure of perception itself. Uh, the, the seasons providing at once a kind of climate, to use his words, uh, a circumstance, uh, um, as well as a kind of symbol for this way of uh, being and uh, knowing. Um, knowing our experience. Um, the seasons are a kind of uh, answer, uh, you could say, in Stevens for traditional myth, uh, providing a kind of uh, structure of, of uh, recurrence uh, and, and recovery. Well, how does such a poet imagine the end of life, <coughs> of his life in particular? Can a vision of the world that's so focused on happiness really include death and loss? Uh, can, it, can it really uh, include, in its account of the world that is so right, can it really uh, include grief? <coughs> Stevens wants not an alternative to religion, but, as he says, a substitute for it. In particular, a substitute for the solutions religion gives to death. Poetry is a means of redemption, Stephen said in that, that adage, uh, and he meant it. But what exactly did he mean by it? We'll look at a number of poems that, that suggest answers, <coughs> beginning with, on page 260, uh, a poem called Large Red Man Reading. <coughs> a, uh, uh, a poem included in uh, 
written after, but uh, written after the Aurora's of Autumn, but included in the uh, volume called <coughs> the Aurora's of Autumn. There were ghosts that returned to earth to hear his phrases. As he sat there reading aloud the great blue tabulae, they were those from the wilderness of stars that had expected more, those that have come to hear him read. There were those that returned to hear him read from the poem of life of the pans above the stove, the pots on the table, the tulips among them, another sort of domestic still life, a little like that in poems of our climate. They were those that would have wept to step barefoot into reality. They would have wept and been happy, have shivered in the frost and cried out to feel it again, have run fingers over leaves and against the most coiled thorn, have seized on what was ugly and laughed as he sat there reading from out of the purple tabulae. Now the tabulae have, have gotten redder. They were blue, now they're purple. As he sat there reading from out of the purple tabulae, the outlines of being and its expressings, the syllables of its law, poesis, poesis, the literal characters, the Vatic lines, which in those ears and in those thin, those spended hearts took on color, took on shape and the size of things as they are, and spoke the feeling for them, which is what they had lacked. This is a version of the the hero poet in Stevens as a kind of creative force, uh, a figure that appears in Stevens's poems in many guises as a scholar of one candle, as the single man, uh, uh, as a rabbi, as, uh, uh, as a giant. Uh, in Notes Towards a Supreme Fiction, he's called the McCullough. <laughs> in what sense is However, this creative force, this giant, this figure of the poet, a reader. What sense does it mean, does it make to call the poet a reader? What the poet does here uh, is read the world. Writing is a kind of reading for Stevens. He reads the world as if it were a poetic text. His poem is a kind of reading. It's a kind of reading. Uh, in the sense of interpretation as, and in the sense of reading aloud, as I've just been doing. It's a vocalization of the outlines of being and its expressings, to use Stevens's phrase. It's a kind of putting into speech of the world, of experience. The suggestion is that the poet's utterance, which is something that sounds, it sounds in the ear, is a kind of decoding of the primary text of the world, suggesting that the world is a kind of poem, uh, something that can be and must be read uh, in just the same way that we read poems on the page. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's one thing that reading poems on the page can help us to do for Stevens. That is, in a sense, learn how to read the world. Let's look at this figure a little more closely. Uh, the, the creator Stevens describes here as elsewhere is large. Why? Well, uh, Stevens himself was. He was a big guy. <coughs> uh, he's he's, he's uh, large too because he's a parent. He's a grown up. Uh, he's a kind of consoling and, and comprehensive figure in this poem and in others. He's also large uh, because he is an abstraction. Uh, he's, in that sense, a generalization. When Stephen speaks of the abstract, uh, he doesn't mean the insubstantial or invisible, but rather the general. 
a kind of representative and, and summative figure <coughs> made out of many parts. In this sense, uh, the large red man is large because he is a kind of abstraction. He is the sum of many parts. Uh, he represents, as I say, a, a general human capacity. He's red, moreover, because he's vital, primitive, in the sense of primary and or aboriginal. He is a Native American. Uh, native in the sense that he's a kind of projection of a place uh, located in it, rooted in uh, uh, the place. Uh, uh, Adam, after all, uh, means red clay, doesn't it? He's red also uh, because he is red-blooded. <coughs> he's healthy. Uh, and and uh, uh, you know, keep in mind that all these 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 are properties are, are sort of metaphors for figures uh, or figures for human capacity for aspects of voice and of soul. Uh, and finally, he's red because he's a reader. Uh, Stevens is punning. Uh, he's he's suggesting that to be a reader, to read, is to be able to recognize and speak the language of the world. Uh, and it is in the process to be reddened, to be uh, filled with vitality uh, and life and native strength uh, and blood. What Stevens calls in this poem, feeling. He spoke the feeling for his auditors, which is what they had lacked. Think of those, those auditors, those ghosts who come to hear the poem, the poem that he's chanting, as uh, well as well, they are they are figures of the dead. You could think of them as uh, representing dead parts of ourselves, uh, our ourselves uh, uh, living uh, in dead ways. Uh, you can see them uh, representing anyone who comes to poetry uh, in some. Uh, uh, state of, of death or of deadened feeling, which is, of course, the feeling that uh, uh, the people in the wasteland have. <coughs> uh, think of them as anyone who comes to poetry uh, seeking to know life uh, and to be creative. Uh, renewal, uh, regeneration, this is what the poem gives them. Uh, it's what Stevens wants. Uh, that's Williams' theme. It's Stevens' too. <coughs> Poesis, that Greek word means making. Uh, poetry is a means of redemption because it speaks feeling. Uh, and feeling in Stevens is a matter of sense, of sentiment. <coughs> Some of Stevens's detractors, which he has, it must be admitted, uh, view him as, as, a, uh, as a kind of <coughs> sterile uh, intellectualist. Uh, this is not true. Uh, Stevens is fundamentally a poet of sentiment, and in this way is, uh, in quite uh, conventional ways, a romantic poet. He has, has many defenses against the, the obvious danger of uh, uh, being uh, a poet of sentiment, that is, sentimentality. <coughs> How does he avoid being sentimental? Well, there's all that nonsense in Stevens. There's the impersonality. Uh, there's continually a kind of acute self-consciousness. There's abstract discourse. Uh, Stevens is often called, because of that abstract discourse, uh, a philosophical poet. Uh, and he is a philosophical poet. However, uh, we need to understand what that means uh, in Stevens's case. <coughs> His work raises philosophical problems and, and often does so explicitly. That is, problems of knowledge, problems of being, which are problems of epistemology, problems of ontology. But it's misleading uh, to um, focus on these dimensions of his work without uh, 
also at the same time addressing the question of sentiment. <coughs> uh, again from his Adagia, uh, Stephen says, a poem should be part of one's sense of life. A poem should be part of one's sense of life. Sense in two senses. Sense in the sense of understanding is always implicated uh, in sense as feeling for Stevens. The, uh, the priority of, of sound in Stevens's poetry, which is the primary sense in poetry for Stevens, uh, the priority of sound in Stevens is, is emblematic of, of, this, uh, of the priority of feeling uh, in Stevens, uh, emblematic of the priority of aesthetics for Stevens. Uh, aesthetics, the domain of the senses and of feeling, uh, the priority of aesthetics over and against philosophy. Uh, Stevens is a philosophical poet who includes philosophy as a kind of partial knowledge within the larger total knowledge uh, that uh, is a knowledge of feeling that the aesthetic that poetry provides and imparts. Uh, let's look <coughs> together at, at uh, three poems that, that give a, a sense of, of this total knowledge that I'm talking about. Uh, a total knowledge representing a kind of unity of, of uh, mind and body for Stevens that incorporate feeling, uh, incorporate sense. For example, the poem that took the place of a mountain on page 264. <coughs> uh, Stevens, like, like his uh, great inheritor, John Ashbery, I think, um, uh, wrote titles <laughs> and collected them uh, and is the author of, uh, uh, you know, not just great poems but great titles. Uh, and here's one. <coughs> uh, here and in other late uh, Stevens poems, <coughs> poems that he wrote specifically having in mind uh, uh, producing or <laughs> reflecting on his collected poems. And the, uh, incidentally, the, uh, this is a kind of dream uh, that Stevens's <coughs> whole career uh, is characterized by. That is the sense of creating uh, a body of work that would be in some sense total. Uh, his, you know, his first book is called Harmonium, and it's an enormous book which he waited a long time to publish. Uh, and uh, he um, uh, imagined perhaps producing a, um, a book called The Whole of Harmonium. Uh, his, his poem, Notes Towards a Supreme Fiction, uh, suggests that ambition to produce, again, a sort of supreme fiction, a kind of total uh, poem, uh, even as that title also uh, uh, admits the impossibility of doing so. <coughs> well. Uh, here, uh, late in life, uh, in 1952, uh, he is uh, contemplating his career as a whole and the body of work he has produced. Uh, and this is a, um, a poem reflecting on that. There it was, word for word, the poem that took the place of a mountain. He breathed its oxygen even when the book lay turned in the dust of his table. It reminded him how he had needed a place to go in his own direction when he began. How, in the process of creating that body of work, he had recomposed the pines, shifted the rocks, and picked his way among clouds <coughs> for the outlook that would be right where he would be complete in an unexplained completion, the exact rock where his inexactnesses would discover, at last, the view toward which they had edged, where he could lie and, gazing down at the sea, recognize his unique and solitary home. Here, producing a poem, producing a body of poetry, uh, living in poetry in the way Stevens has done is like climbing a mountain. 
Or rather, it's like both creating and climbing the mountain. <laughs> both those things, step by step, or word for word. That's that interesting phrase that the poem begins with. Uh, usually we use that phrase to uh, describe what? A kind of transcription? It was a word for word transcript. Uh, or a translation. It was a word for word translation. Uh, it suggests that the poem <coughs> that Stevens is talking about is in some sense a transcription or translation, word for word, which suggests in turn that the world was, even before it was put into language, already a kind of language, a set of words, a text. And this develops the idea that the, the poet in Stevens is a reader. Uh, writing here uh, is an act of rendering the words of the world, making them over into the poet's words, making them, in this process, available in and through his words. Uh, what is the, the nature of this translation or substitution? <coughs> the phrase, took the place of uh, connotes both displacement and compensation. The poem took the place of a mountain. It displaces it. It also compensates for the loss of it. <coughs> the world is somehow lost, always, in experience, but then also found again in writing. Uh, in the act of creation that Stevens refers to as expressing his need of a place to go in his own direction. It reminded him how he had needed a place to go in his own direction. Th that could almost be Frost. Uh, that's, a, that's the kind of phrase Frost might have used. Uh, it suggests both a uh, kind of public ambition, perhaps, uh, also personal and private escape, some kind of, uh, in any case, claim for independence and originality, eccentricity even. It says that in uh, um, remaking the world in language, in the act of going in his own direction, uh, the poet has created a certain point of view, a perspective on experience. It's what Stevens will call his unique and solitary home, uh, the world according to himself. Uh, which is as it must be for all of us. Stephen says he would be complete in an unexplained completion. Completion, meaning the end of the climb that is creation, must go beyond explanation. In the same way that poetry, the aesthetic, must pass beyond philosophy. Stephen says in, a, in another poem, uh, you know, that poetry must uh, resist the intelligence almost successfully. He, he's, he's interested in an unexplained completion. He values poetry's inexactnesses. It's an interesting word. <coughs> His inexactnesses carry him along as he climbs edgewise. He edges with the implication that, I suppose, on a mountaintop, which is a precarious place where the ground is steep and unstable, uh, you can only proceed carefully. Uh, you can only uh, proceed by edging along. Poetry's path in Stevens is oblique. <coughs> tell all the truth, but tell it slant, Emily Dickinson said. Stevens is telling is oblique, slanted. He moves edgewise in his poems. He goes up the side of his high subjects. Yet, in this way, he gives uh, poetry, in the end, a view of the whole. Uh, and for all of its imaginings, and for all of its celebration of imagining, for all of its celebration of, of poetry's power to displace the world, to take the place of a mountain. The poem rests on a rock that is real, uh, the rock of the real, which is a metaphor that recurs over and over again in Stevens's late poetry. 
you could keep in mind another one of Stevens's adages, one of his late adages. The real, he says, is only the base, but it is the base. Uh, this, this could be a kind of epigraph for, for this poem and, and, and many other Stevens poems. And it's, it's an important uh, idea to keep in mind as you, as you try to think about the relationship between imagination and reality in Stevens. <coughs> Along with the idea, in fact, uh, that Stevens is a philosophical poet and a kind of intellectualist, uh, there is the idea that he is an idealist uh, who, uh, because he believes in the power of the mind to bring reality into being, denies the reality of the physical world. <coughs> this is another mistake, uh, as that adage about the real and, and, and the base suggests. Stevens' last book of poems is called The Rock. Uh, there are many images of, of material reality uh, in um, uh, uh, late Stevens, and they're important. Uh, look at the plain sense of things on 266, another late poem. <coughs> Think of how many of these poems focus on moments of seasonal transition. Here's another. After the leaves have fallen, we return to a plain sense of things. And there's that word sense again in all of its multiple senses. It is as if we had come to an end of the imagination, inanimate in an inert savoir. <laughs> and he continues, yet the absence of the imagination had itself to be imagined. The great pond, the plain sense of it, without reflections, leaves, mud, water like dirty glass, expressing silence of a sort. Silence of a rat come out to sea, the great pond and its waste of the lilies, all this had to be imagined as an inevitable knowledge required, as a necessity requires. Uh, here, Stevens is imagining at, at uh, the end of the fall, uh, imagining what is beyond imagination. Uh, imagining, too, where imagination ends, where it tends, its goal. Compare this to a, a late poem like uh, uh, Circus Animals' Desertion in, in Yeats, where the poets descends from the ladders of imagination into the foul rag and bone shop of the heart. Stevens is treating this theme himself in an somewhat different terms. You could also compare this poem to Poems of Our Climate uh, and the uh, uh, will to come to primary terms uh, in that poem or The Man in the Dump. Uh, just as in Poems from Our Climate, as Stevens does arrive at something like primary terms, what he calls here the plain sense of things, what might be a limit or base for imagination, the real. His poem moves to recover and reassert the power of imagination. Even the end of imagination, he says, had to be imagined as an inevitable knowledge, an inevitable knowledge, a phrase that, that equivocates uh, as to whether this knowledge had to be imagined of necessity uh, or whether its necessity had itself to be imagined, uh, which is an idea that, that reasserts the, the dominance of the mind, uh, even in its, in its defeat, you could say. Uh, and in this sense, uh, the poem is a small example of that long uh, tradition of the uh, Kantian sublime, where the mind is somehow uh, uh, checked and awed by natural uh, force or natural powers, something greater than itself, uh, and then uh, recovers its strength as it recognizes uh, that uh, this defeat is itself a kind of mental representation or construction. <coughs> External reality, its, its endurance and its materiality uh, is in fact a kind of consoling fact for Stevens. 
uh, which he uh, affirms uh, in another poem, a poem not in your anthology, but one of my favorites, uh, placed last in his collected poems uh, and in your RAS packet. <coughs> it's called Not Ideas About the Thing, But the Thing Itself. Again, a kind of uh, the title suggests a, a kind of encounter with reality in its primary forms. <coughs> Placed here uh, at, uh, at at the very end of his collected poems, it was a you know a kind of uh, well uh, last poem, though it was not by any means the last poem he would write. <coughs> At the earliest ending of winter, and now it's, it's not the end of fall, but rather the end of winter that Stevens is writing about, in March, a scrawny cry from outside, and that's a wonderfully resonant phrase, outside the room, outside the mind, seemed like a sound, nonetheless, in his mind. He knew that he had he knew that he heard it, a bird's cry at daylight or before, in the early March wind. The sun was rising at six, no longer a battered panache above snow. It would have been outside. It was not from the vast ventriloquism of sleep's faded paper mache. It wasn't something I dreamed or made up. It can't have been. The sun was coming from outside. That scrawny cry, and he comes back to that word, that scrawny cry, it was a chorister whose C preceded the choir. It was part of the colossal sun, surrounded by its choral rings still far away. It was like a new knowledge of reality. The poem begins with a kind of confusion of inner and outer. Uh, uh, the cry that the poet hears, he wants to say is outside him. It's important for him to say it's outside him. Why? Uh, if it's not outside him, then uh, the, uh, the sign of life that it gives and the promise of life's continuance would be his own projection uh, and would be uh, something uh, uh, liable to die with him. He wants proof that the world will go on without him, that spring will come again. The cry is a kind of elemental noise, uh, the noise of the elements themselves, uh, the sound of the seasons changing. It is a complaint, a lament, alarm, exclamation, Shout for joy. Uh, it's the sound of daytime returning, and with it, spring. At the earliest moment, kind of emergence from winter and death. Stevens is a poet of change, uh, but of change within regenerative cycles of which night and day and the seasons themselves are our primary instances and symbols. Uh, notice also that uh, the world makes itself known here in and as sound. It's something, uh, life is something you hear. Uh, this also is like Frost. <coughs> the world is again a kind of language. It's speaking to us. Uh, Stevens, uh, in describing it through metaphors and similes and finding words for it, uh, is performing an act of reading again, of transcription, of translation. Uh, in particular, he is providing figurative language for understanding it. He calls the cry scrawny. It's a great word. He uses it twice. Uh, what kinds of things are scrawny? Uh, babies are scrawny, right? Old men are scrawny. <coughs> uh, both. Uh, here, uh, both ideas are, are held together at this moment of seasonal transition when the year is old and the year is new at the same time. 
Uh, that single bird that gives that cry uh, is the poet's double, kind of echo. Uh, maybe each are echoes of the other. Uh, the bird suggests an image of how the poet himself is integrated into the creative event that is the simple, ordinary return of the world with dawn. The poet, like the bird, is merely a chorister, a voice among other voices in a kind of harmonium that is total and whole. In this case, his C precedes the choir. That is, <coughs> all the other voices that are going to follow this first one in the morning. That C tunes them. Here, alliteration is important. Uh, it links the cry and the choir and the chorister and the choral rings and the colossal sun that generates all of them in a series of rings, choral rings, vocal rings. Uh, and it's a wonderful uh, image of synesthesia. This is light coming as sound and sound as light at once, a kind of total sensory experience. Uh, Stevens is imagining morning, uh, imagining it as a kind of synesthetic event, uh, and as uh, the arrival of a series of linked creativities, all derived from the colossal sun, of which the poem's bold and somewhat uh, simple, uh, playful, almost childlike alliteration and punning are instances, are, are simply forms of this choral music. The poem's linguistic play, in other words, uh, displays the poet's power to uh, link the things of the world through sound, to produce connections between them through words, uh, and is itself a kind of model and a case of those choral rings through which the world is coming into being. Stephen's poem, in other words, is a small version of the creative event it's describing. Uh, it is like a new knowledge of reality, he says. New because refreshed, uh, newly experienced, newly activated. It's also a knowledge of reality existing exactly in its newness. The real is what is new, what is emerging, what is fresh carrying change to us. Uh, pay attention to, to the sun in, in all of, of Stevens' poems, but, but especially in these late poems where uh, the sun is a kind of uh, mythic presence. Uh, the poet waits for the sun uh, with, the, uh, uh, with, with the heroine Penelope uh, in the world as meditation. Uh, Penelope there is the son's bride, uh, Ulysses' wife. Uh, look at that poem as a kind of late, sublime version of Sunday morning. Another version of the son, uh, of this heroic, creative figure, is the giant in uh, the poem called A Primitive Like an Orb. This is a somewhat longer poem, and I'd like to look at uh, some of its parts with you. Uh, the question in this poem, which is in your IAS packet, is <coughs> it's really the same question uh, as is posed uh, by uh, not ideas about the thing, and that is what is the relationship between Stevens's poem and the poems of the world? Uh, what is the link between his creativity or our creativity in this larger system? of creation that uh, Stevens' poetry evokes. Or uh, in the language of this poem, what is the relationship between Stevens' poems and the essential poem at the center of things? Let me read the second section first. <coughs> the essential poem at the center of things is the, you know, the first line. It's kind of the, the theme that he will now explore. And he says about it, 
we do not prove the existence of the poem. We, we, don't, we, we, don't, we can't prove this kind of bigger thing. Rather, it is something seen and known in lesser poems, in parts. It is the huge high s harmony that sounds a little in a little suddenly by means of a separate sense. It is, and it is not, and therefore is. <laughs> in the instant of speech, the breath of an accelerando moves, captives the being, widens, and was there. You can't grasp it. It passes. That separate sense is the sense that, that Stevens's poems want to get at uh, in their inexactnesses, sometimes in their nonsense. They're, they're gesturing towards it. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, the existence of that separate sense, which is a sense of the whole, of a kind of totality, uh, is affirmed precisely through its invisibility, its non-existence. It is and it is not, and therefore is. Uh, it exists in its inaccessibility, uh, in the fact that it is always gone. <coughs> it was always just there. We feel it only ever in its parts, which are synecdoches, linked to the whole like the scrawny cry and the coral rings of the colossal sun. They are parts that point to a whole. Uh, Stevens carries this idea forward then in uh, section four. <coughs> Here he is uh, rewriting Theseus lines from A Midsummer Night's Dream, um, the uh, <coughs> lunatic, the lover, uh, or excuse me, the poet, the lunatic, and the lover are of imagination all compact. Here he says, our poem proves another and the whole, well, excuse me, one poem, for the clairvoyant men that need no proof. Who are they? The lover, the believer, and the poet. The words are chosen out of their desire. That's important in Stevens. And remember, desire is hot in us. Uh, what is desire? It is the joy of language. Is it something apart from us? No, it's in us, when it is themselves. With these, with these words, the words chosen out of desire, the lover, the believer, the poet, celebrate the central poem, the fulfillment of fulfillments in opulent last terms, the largest, and now he's going to start to get a little carried away, bulging, still, with more, comma, moving on to the next stanza, until the used to earth and sky and the tree and cloud, the used to tree and used to cloud, what was there a moment before, lose the old uses that they made of them, and they, these men and earth and sky, inform each other by sharp information, sharp free knowledges secreted until then, breaches of that which held them fast. It is as if the central poem became the world. <coughs> and the world, the central poem. Each one the mate of the other. And you can think about how uh, often one finds uh, images of wedding uh, or of mating in Stevens, such as in uh, The World as Meditation as if summer was a spouse, espoused each morning, each long afternoon, and the mate of summer, her mirror and her look. The essential poem begets the others, it creates the others. The light of it is not a light apart, uphill. Rather, it exists down below in all of its component parts. <coughs> uh, let me read now sections seven and following. Uh, it is one of the great sentences in, in modern poetry. Uh, it's, a, it's a, well, the poem begins with a declaration. <coughs> the central poem is the poem of the whole. This might seem to say it all, but rather 
this declaration, this, this principle, is a generative one that will now go on generating uh, a verse, uh, much as this principle in uh, the world goes on generating the world that we experience. The central poem is the poem of the whole, the poem of the composition of the whole, the composition of blue sea and of green, of blue light and of green, as lesser poems, and the miraculous multiplex of lesser poems. And again, by poems he means, well, he means individual uh, poems. He also means individual perceptions, individual creative acts, uh, all our forms of making in the world. The miraculous multiplex of lesser poems are brought then not merely into a whole, but a poem of the whole, the essential that is compact of its part, the roundness that pulls tight the final ring, and that which in an altitude would soar, a this, a power, a principle, or it may be the meditation of a principle, or else, and here's Stevens' incredible uh, uh, rhetorical and imaginative uh, ability to keep going and say or and go on imagining things, or else an inherent order active to be itself, a nature to its natives all beneficent, a repose, utmost repose, the muscles of a magnet aptly felt. This is what this total being, this total poem that he is imagining is like. And as he imagines it as a totality, he starts to imagine it as a person, a giant on the horizon, glistening, and in bright excellence adorned, crested with every prodigal familiar fire and unfamiliar escapades, wieroos and scintillant sizzlings, such as children like, vested in the serious folds of majesty, moving around and behind, a following, a source of trumpeting seraphs in the eye, a source of pleasant outbursts on the ear. Uh, it's a wonderful vision. Uh, it calls to mind the great appearance, the great spectacle of the appearance of the world, seen here suddenly as a kind of majestic giant figure uh, approaching us uh, with uh, uh, the folds of uh, royal garments. Uh, that's what appearance is like for Stevens. And I think of uh, the weather, uh, the hills of Connecticut, of Sleeping Giant uh, itself, as uh, Stevens imagines uh, a kind of uh, uh, experience of the landscape and of the world uh, as humanized, a uh, kind of humanized totality uh, that is it's like a, a kind of generalized and abstract image of the human. <coughs> Uh, an image of the human that is realized for Stevens in and through play. Uh, it, it's uh, uh, the, the, these these garments. Uh, they're 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 something that pleasure children and that pleasure us as children are pleasured. <coughs> uh, the giant is uh, a kind of uh, image of the essential poem, as he calls it, <coughs> uh, and he will go on to describe it a little bit uh, further. Uh, he now says, here then, in section 11, is an abstraction, what he's talking about, this general poem, that's given head, uh, in the sense of allowed to, to go, to, uh, uh, to uh, um, uh, um, uh, expand and, and um, uh, have its way, but also uh, anthropomorphized. Uh, becoming a giant on the horizon, given arms, in fact, a massive body and long legs stretched out, a definition with an illustration. That is, the world is at once a definition with an illustration, not too exactly labeled, a large among the smalls of it, a close parental magnitude at the center on the horizon, concentrum, grave and prodigious person, patron of origins. <coughs> uh, here, man is not created in God's image, but rather this image of God in man's, uh, brought into being uh, through play, uh, through all the senses of sense, uh, uh, representing a definition with an illustration, <coughs> picture and word, uh, again, abstract and concrete. Uh, an aesthetic whole uh, that includes um, 
uh, includes a kind of philosophical knowledge in it. Uh, this is what all art for Stevens aims at. He says simply, that's it. The lover writes, the believer hears, the poet mumbles and the painter sees each one his faded eccentricity as a part. Everything we do is a part, only a part, but a part, but tenacious particle of the skeleton of the ether, this big, giant thing. Perceptions, clods of color, the giant of nothingness, each one, each one of us, each one thing that we do, and the giant, ever-changing, living in change. That's it, meaning. That's the end of imagination. <laughs> It's the sense of uh, its ending, its terminus, its goal. Uh, but it turns out to be not no ending at all, but rather an experience of a whole that is ongoing, that is an experience of change that includes death, uh, includes our own deaths, uh, uh, in a kind of totality uh, that uh, is ever-changing and living precisely in change. Well. Uh, We'll go on to a very different poet on Wednesday, W. H. Auden. <laughs>